Okay, um, good evening everyone. Um, my name is Paul Dennett. I'm the City Mayor of Salford, but I'm also the lead within the combined authority here in Greater Manchester for housing, infrastructure and homelessness. And I guess in both of those kind of capacities, um, I welcome the work of RTPI and also University College London on looking at local authority direct delivery of housing. It's absolutely fantastic that we're actually talking about the role of local councils and local authorities in the housing market and how they can hopefully work collaboratively to tackle what is a housing crisis. Um, I guess just by way of introduction, um, just say thank you for RTPI for the great work you're doing in this space, which certainly, sorry, throwing my pen, <laughs> certainly from my point of view, is really supporting us in a combined authority with the evidence base, the data, the intelligence to actually drive forward our housing strategy and our spatial plans for the next 20 years. Really important work, and I just want to place on record my thanks and appreciation because, you know, times are, are really hard at the moment in local government and combined authorities. My local authority has seen its revenue budget reduced by 211 million since 2010. And its revenue support grant reduced by over 53%. So any way we can get evidence, data and intelligence into the system, I certainly welcome. So thank you. Just by way of contextualising this, I guess for me, I look at local authority direct delivery of housing through the lens of what is a housing crisis or a failed housing market, which, as you all know, the government has also acknowledged in its own housing white paper. But just to bring that home, really, for, for Greater Manchester, what does that mean? So within Greater Manchester, you know, we've seen over 92,000 homes purchased under the right to buy <coughs> since 1980, since the legislation was introduced. Approximately 40% of those homes find their way into the private rented sector. Within the private rented sector, within Greater Manchester, we know we've got issues with decency, and approximately 30% of our stock within Greater Manchester is non-decent, determined by the government's own um, decent homes standard. At the moment, we have 97,000 people on our housing waiting lists across the 10 local authorities in Greater Manchester. 26,000 of those households are on housing registers but in priority need, to just give you an understanding of the data here. Rough sleeping has increased by 487%, so that's from 41 cases of rough sleeping in 2010 to 241 in 2018. And from an affordability point of view, 30% of households would have to spend more than 35% of their household income to meet the median private rents. And a lot of the growth, certainly since 2001 up until 2011, looking at the data we've got available, has been very much in the private rented sector. So 96% of Greater Manchester's growth between those two periods in time has been private rented sector. We also know that we need an extra 15,000 supported accommodation units if we're to genuinely meet need by 2035. And some of those stats has come out of the work we've been doing with our health and social care partnership through health devolution within Greater Manchester to better understand need. And one of the things I've been really passionate about is trying to get housing up the political agenda in terms of its importance, both as a city region, as a local authority myself in the city of Salford, but also just generally within, within the nation. And I think we're doing that. Um, Greater Manchester is responding to the housing crisis. We have Mayor Burnham's initiative, Bed Every Night, which is absolutely fantastic in terms of trying to keep people off our streets and put a roof over people's heads. Working with our housing providers, predominantly the housing associations, around the social impact bond rollout. And also we've recently rolled out Housing First, one of three city regions in the country to receive funding from the Ministry of Housing, Communities and Local Government to actually do that. So it's within that context, I guess, I actually see the role of local government in terms of tackling what is a housing crisis. And I think history teaches an, a really interesting lesson. And if we look back after World War II, you know, homelessness was rendered virtually statistically insignificant in this country. And I think we've got to ask ourselves, well, why was that? Well, in my opinion, it was because the majority of the homes being built at that time were being built by local authorities up and down the country. Approximately 50% of the homes being built were being built by local authorities. So quite clearly, the answer for me 
is very much in the role of the state at a local level, at a city regional level, and at a national level to ensure we, we deliver on some of this. So for Salford at the moment, just to give you some statistics, affordable housing need is we need 613 homes a year to genuinely meet affordable housing need within the city of Salford. At the moment, 5,867 households sit on our housing register within the city. For every property that becomes available on our housing register, um, 39 bids are often placed. Affordable housing relets are down by 17%. Um, that's an indication that there isn't much turnover at the moment in terms of affordable housing, social rents. Um, average house prices to income, the ratio is 5.9, which is up from 5.2. So housing increasingly is becoming unaffordable for lots of people. Homelessness presentations in 1718 in the city of Salford were 1,767. And private rents have increased to an average of 756 pounds per month in the city of Salford. So that's the context we faced as a city. And one of the things I was determined to do was think strategically about how we can tackle this. Yes, working with housing providers. Yes, through the planning system, trying to put pressure on developers. Um, in terms of Section 106, affordable housing conversations, conversations with Home England about grant accessing that. But what we did was we set up our own wholly owned development company called Dereve. That's been set up outside of the housing revenue account because what we don't really want is right to buy to apply to some of the things we're going to be building through the development company because where's the incentive? You'll build new homes, they'll be purchased at massive discounts and then the local authority will be left with the debt to service. That just doesn't seem right. So right to buy, I think, has a, an awful lot to answer for in terms of the state of the housing market we face at the moment. At the moment, we've approved 117 new homes up until 2023-24, and that's with resources of around 15.8 million. 11 million of that is funded through grant from the City Council, so that will include Section 106 contributions in what we refer to as commuted sums, and also borrowing of in the region of 4.8 million. And obviously that will be repaid through the rental income when we build the homes. It's various schemes, there's a scheme on site at the moment in Dutchie and Charlestown, but we believe it's absolutely critical that local authorities play a role in delivering housing for the future. Truly affordable housing has been the primary motivator for my city council. Why? Because through the planning system time and time again by the private development community we are being told that schemes are non-viable, we can't contribute to affordable housing, we can't contribute to infrastructure costs. Now I understand when you look at the country there is differences. You know the City of London arguably is an atypical housing market because property prices, land prices are very different in that part of the country. In the north, we have significant infrastructure challenges. We are a post-industrial part of the country. As a consequence of that, you know, land remediation, land assembly, infrastructure, retrofitting infrastructure, all has a cost associated with it. Do I think moving forward the development community are going to be solely able to pick up the cost of that? No, I don't. And if anyone's seen the IPPR work recently, looking at the disparities in terms of allocation of public capital, you realise that the North actually has been left out in the cold over many, many years here. And actually to play catch up, the government is going to have to commit significant sources of capital and revenue to genuinely enable us to to our, meet our aspirations, really, as a, a city region. So it's within that context we fundamentally believe, certainly in, in, in Salford, in local authorities playing a direct role in the delivery of housing in the 21st century to almost mitigate what is a failing housing market, which has been driven primarily, in my opinion, by profit motives. You know, at the end of the day, this idea of neoliberalism has fundamentally failed, you know, our economy. This is about us getting back to well, what is that relationship between the market and the state and what role does the state actually play? I remember, you know, under the, the previous Labour government, you know, Anthony Giddens talking about the third way and then we saw the birth of public-private partnerships and private finance initiatives. And I think many of us in this room can probably point to lots of those which have fundamentally failed this country, actually. Yes, we might have new schools to point to and various things we can point to, but we've actually paid a premium for some of that. And I guess for me, it's about the fourth way. This is about a new relationship between the market and the state, but a real meaningful one that is genuinely built on human need and making sure that we meet people's needs. So welcome to this. Thank you to RTPI and 
UCL for the fantastic work you're doing. You're making my life all, an awful lot easier by producing this sort of research. So thank you very much. I'll hand over to my esteemed colleague. Thank you, Paul. Uh, great start and something that puts this research right into the context of what's actually happening out on the streets of Manchester and Salford uh, and the absolutely desperate need for housing that some people are facing. Um, I'm Ian Tant. I'm the president of the Royal Town Planning Institute. Uh, and I'm delighted to be here in Manchester, back in Manchester, for my second time in a fortnight. Um, and uh, those in the RTPI who know me know that one of the reasons I'm delighted to be here in Manchester is because actually I was born just down the road here uh, when the maternity unit of St Mary's Hospital was actually about three doors further on from here. So I'm, I'm right back to where I started, literally. Um, can I start off by thanking Professor Jan Smallfit and Dr Ben Clifford uh, for the work they're doing, the continuing research they're doing on behalf of the Royal Town Planning Institute. This work is really important to planners, and I'll explain in a few minutes some of the reasons why it is so important. Um, but I also would like to, to extend those thanks to the advisory group, group who've worked with you on the research, uh, and it's worth picking these people out by name because they've made a huge contribution to what's happening in this, re uh, this research. So Sarah Davis of the Chartered Institute of Housing, uh, Mike Dieth of HDA Design uh, Architect, Mike Keeley, Planning Officer Society, Ken Lee of Reeveswood Consulting, who's the chair of the SIPFA Housing Panel, uh, important financial aspect brought to bear, Julian uh, McInnes of Julian McInnes Associates, Tony Mulhall, RICS, uh, Andrew Peart of Gately PLC, Solicitor, and Nick Porter of the Local Government Association um, all make a great contribution. Uh, it's also worth noting that the funding for this research uh, has been jo uh, provided jointly by the RTPI, but particularly the Royal Town Planning Institute's Northwest, Northeast, West Midlands and Southeast branches uh, who've contributed funding towards it. Uh, and I'd also like to thank G.L. Hearn, who funded the direct, re direct survey that lies within the research. In speaking to the planning convention of the Royal Town Planning Institute last week, um, I noted that planning permissions have been granted for housing uh, at an increasing rate year on year for the past seven years. Uh, we're now granting over 350,000 planning permissions a year, that's 350,000 dwellings being granted planning permission. Mm -hmm. But the starts that uh, should accompany those planning permissions are falling behind uh, by some considerable margin. The delivery of housing is therefore uh, the really critical factor in all of this. Uh, we're granting the planning permissions, we need to maintain that stock of planning permissions but we really need to see delivery picking up. And the government's target of 300,000 houses a year being delivered uh, by the middle of the next decade is something that when we look back on the historical record, we realize has only ever been achieved in the past when we've had significant public sector house building contributing to that total. And in fact, it's worth noting that on, by and large, Private sector house building has maintained a steady level to around 150,000 dwellings a year, sometimes more, sometimes less. So 300,000 dwellings a year really needs to be made up by effectively an equivalent level of public sector delivery of housing. Uh, planners recognise their role uh, in delivery, increasingly recognising their role, um, the planners within local authorities, the local planning authorities themselves, are being held essentially to account by the government for the delivery of housing in their, their areas. Uh, and as Paul's indicated, whilst the, the local authorities can put pressure on private developers to do their best to deliver, uh, there is more to be done. And this research addresses really key issues 
in terms of the advice that local planning authorities, local authorities and planners within them need, essentially in structuring teams to deliver. The report identifies areas in which we're struggling to meet the planning objectives through our development management systems. And they include the uh, provision of affordable housing. There is a, still a serious continuing lack of affordable housing. Um, there is a lack of provision for particular needs, and in that we're, we're talking about special housing needs, we're talking about the needs of elderly people. And we have also have to recognise that there is still some really poor quality housing being delivered uh, at the moment. And it's interesting to note um, from my glimpse through the, the report as it stands uh, at the moment in summary, that one of the, the key motivators for local authorities in getting involved in direct provision of housing is a drive to improve quality. And that's something which, as the Institute, we applaud. Uh, and we stand with a number of our other built environment professionals in, in doing that uh, and, and in looking for better quality housing. One thing that planners across the public and private sector can agree and do agree on, which is that local authorities need to be more engaged in the delivery of housing. And direct delivery is a particularly important part of that. The planners, we know that we can play a role. And we know that that role um, can be in a variety of different ways. We can do so by treating the local plan as a housing delivery strategy rather than a simple uh, policy document covering a range of issues, a particular focus on delivering the local plan. We can support local authority-led development in delivering housing. And we can join in multidisciplinary delivery teams with housing officers, with chartered surveyors, uh, and with a range of other professionals. Phase one of this research, published in 2017, has had a big impact in policy circles, uh, with planners, and with other development professionals. We recognise the importance of that research, and we have uh, relied on and worked with that research over the last two years. Since then, there's been an increase in engagement in the direct delivery of housing, but as I've said, much more can be done. And the government has made clear that local authorities can play a crucial role in housing delivery. So the Royal Town Planning Institute um, looks to this second phase of the research and expects that it will provide even richer information. It will have an increased impact in sharing experience and in promoting the role of planners in achieving increased, much increased delivery whilst maintaining scrutiny in the ways that we must. There are a number of key recommendations in here, and we note that one of those recommendations is for the Royal Town Planning Institute itself. It's a recommendation about giving guidance, and we will respond to that recommendation. Uh, our aim is to produce practice advice later this year that responds directly to what is in the research. So thank you again, Janice and Ben, for the work so far. Um, we welcome feedback on the research. That feedback particularly will help us deliver the guidance and advice to our members. Uh, but without further ado, can I please hand over to Janice to present the research findings. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much, President. Um, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you very much for coming. Um, what I'm going to do is give you a kind of flavour of the key findings that we have, and you've got those in the report. Um, we will have a much more detailed report of research being launched on the 31st of July. So um, if you're interested in, in more detail how we got to these findings, um, plus some more desk research, you'll be able to see it then. Um, I'm going to give you some of these general findings, and then Ben is going to talk you through uh, a bit more of the detail. But just to say what I'm going to do is really um, based on three separate pieces of research that we've done and they've all been put together 
um, in, in this report and the summary that you have today. So firstly, we did a survey which was funded by Geo Hearn, and this replicated the survey that we did in 2017. And this allowed us to um, look at, uh, to see what changes have been made and so on. And uh, we actually got about 50% of uh, local, well, just let fewer than 50% of councils responded, but the 184 responses overall. So we can see there's still a great interest in, um, in this delivery. <laughs> Secondly, um, we did a 100% desk survey of all councils in England, and this survey is uh, already available uh, in full, and this will actually indicate, it does indicate for each council, whether they have a company, uh, when that company was founded, if we could find that, the name of the company, and then uh, whether they have a JV, and whether they have a housing a revenue account, and whether they're selling housing sites. Um, but the centerpiece of the table, um, making the, the, the other data slightly awkward to use, but the centerpiece is actually web links from each council to give examples of what they're actually doing. And this is not meant to be evaluative in, in saying Council A is doing better than Council B. It's more meant to be illustrative so that um, you can have a click and play. Um, I wonder what this council's doing. Um, I'm interested to see you know, what's, what's happening there. And um, so the material there is all in the public domain. It's nothing there that is um, in any way confidential, but it does include um, business cases for setting up companies. So if you're thinking of doing that, there are some examples there of reports to council executives. It gives, um, it shows you a councillor you know, passing over the key of the door on a new development. Um, it produces material from housing associations and other private sector partners about their relationships with councils. So there's a, there's a huge amount of information there. Um, the third element that we're um, uh, talking about this evening is actually from the uh, work that we've done through holding uh, 12 roundtable discussions and 13 case studies. So it's very rich in information. And when you see the full report, you'll, you'll see a lot more detail of what we found. And uh, we hope, again, that will be useful to colleagues. Um, we're not assuming everybody want, will want to read all of it at once, but if you're looking particularly around um, uh, housing for older people or you're looking at Section 106 or should you be thinking about using clawback or application reviews, there's at least something there that you can start with with some references and so on. So there's something to get you going um, and, and perhaps you might want to approach some of those councils um, to talk to them about how, how they've found it. So that, that's, that's the idea of, of, of the material that, we've, that we're producing. Also, last time in 2017, a lot of colleagues said, well, we don't actually think much is happening. We can't really see these council companies. They're just set up in name only. But I think, um, as, as we've heard from Mayor Dennett this evening and as we've seen in our, in our work, that it takes a couple of years between setting up a council uh, a, a company, sorry, and then actually starting on site. So um, we are still um, at a time where councils are building up their capacity, they're building up their strength, if you like, um, of their teams. And um, I think what we'll see is in the early 2020s, some of, this, some of these companies actually starting to build larger numbers. I mean, clearly, if a council has a, an HRA and then starts a company, then there are already some skills in-house. But about 50% of councils, we have to remember, don't have an HRA. So um, if they're starting with companies, they're having to build up fairly slowly and cautiously, and their developments may well be smaller. But then I think that seems to be a prudent approach, and I, I don't think that we should be critical of that, because um, as we see councils start small, and then gradually they try um, more initiatives and larger developments. So I think that's, that's to be expected. Um, so what have we found? Um, firstly, um, we found that those councils that are really getting underway with housing have a corporate commitment. Now, this might sound obvious, but nevertheless, I mean, it, a corporate commitment goes across the whole council, and it's something which the leader or, or the mayor um, is reminding everybody about all the time. And I think that um, sounds obvious, but um, it doesn't happen in every council. So I think that, that's, that's the first thing. Um, the second thing we found is that when we look at local plans, then we know that they're there to identify housing sites, 
but um, we're starting to see now that some councils are moving much more into associating their local plans with a delivery plan. And this is not just about delivery of sites allocated in the plan, but this is across all types of activity that the councils can uh, implement to deliver housing. So that might be through their HRA, uh, through housing companies, um, through partnership working, through giving funding, to uh, uh, those uh, who have difficulties on sites, with site condition or access, uh, making loans, taking um, some uh, interest in schemes. So we're actually seeing this moving on to another stage. And this is a very proactive approach rather than just assuming the private sector is going to deliver. Um, and this actually is coming through associati associated documents in the local plan. Um, obviously, delivery needs to be a key issue in negotiation. And what we found in one of our case studies, that they have very good policies, and then these policies have been met in part when they've looked at larger developments. But actually, when you look at those policies applied um, on a one-by-one -one basis for d different uh, planning applications, they're not, not been so successful because the development management staff haven't had time really to negotiate them negotiate those policies through. So I think another lesson is you can have great policies, but they're no good if you can't implement them because you don't have the capacity. Again, another truism, but I think it's worthwhile making the point, particularly as we know the government is currently undertaking a study of planning resources and planning skills. Um, another major finding, I think, that we hadn't seen before is that those councils who are delivering more are monitoring more. And what do I mean by that? Um, those councils that seem to be um, on the case um, are actually monitoring every single site, housing site in their area, regardless of its ownership and regardless of its development promoter. So they are almost having a customer relations management system for each site in their area. They have worked out, in the, say in the case of Plymouth, a delivery plan for every site. Um, and they have a named officer who is the lead uh, for that site who, who is looking after it and is the main point of contact, whoever is uh, concerned with its delivery. So I think we're beginning to see this, and this is true in Plymouth, in Bristol, in Doncaster, in South Lakeland. This is not something that's only in one part of the country or one type of authority, um, because Bristol has an HRA and Plymouth doesn't, and nor does South Lakeland. So this is um, a kind of a approach. We have looked at the difference between HRA and non-HRA authorities, and although you'll see that there are different sections on those, in fact, we haven't found that there's a great deal of difference uh, between the two for those sorts of councils who really want to get moving on this. Um, if we think about uh, other factors in delivery, a big change from 2017 is far more councils have their own development surveyor now or access to one, maybe shared, maybe through their joint venture, maybe someone who's working part-time, who's um, an early retiree, um, and they're using them both for their own viability assessments in planning and indeed their own developments. And this, um, at our round tables, uh, this year, I think almost every round table had at least one development su surveyor coming along with a council and, and more you know, back at base. So I think that's a, that's a big change and it demonstrates, I think, um, illustrates how uh, strong councils are considering those skills to be. If we think about um, internal organisation of councils, I think we've found three types of organisation within councils that s those councils really pushing ahead seem to have in one form or another. So the first one is this housing delivery team, which the, which the president me mentioned, where we're having housing and planning officers, um, development surveyors, legal, finance and highways engineers in teams, and they again are dealing with every housing um, site and application regardless of, of ownership and promotion. And those teams are building up gradually and in some councils now they have over 60 staff. Um, and although we can't prove that it, it really um, helps with staff retention, um, clearly those officers working in those teams are getting a huge amount of experience and a bit of a buzz about how they're working across a range of, uh, of, of sites, small and large, and within that, in that team. 
Um, and I think added uh, to that um, is where we that team is monitoring sites for affordable housing. And what's happening is because the experience is um, increasing, it's ensuring that those teams are rather more forthright, perhaps with some of their private sector colleagues about what can be achieved on sites, in both in terms of numbers of um, dwellings and indeed affordable. So the knowledge of, of, of building costs, of how to put together a development, is feeding through into planning negotiation within, within the authority, so which I think um, is, is a useful thing. Um, the second uh, activity that these councils have is generally a housing delivery group, which may meet maybe once a quarter, once every two months. And this is for anyone who has an interest in housing in the area to come along. Um, both to voice their, their issues and to hear what the council's got to say. This might include charities, it might include um, uh, private sector RPs, anyone who's uh, uh, builders, anyone who's interested. And the idea is to, make, is to start those relationships, build the relationships, and to understand what the problems are um, that everybody needs to address. And the third is the political component for this, for both the Housing Delivery Board um, uh, uh, group and the, and the um, fora, is actually um, also to have a Housing Delivery Board led by a very senior politician who, again, meeting monthly, going through all the sites, finding out what the issues are and, and maintaining that momentum, that political leadership and momentum. And again, you might think those three things are fairly standard, but when you put them together, they start to make quite a, a force um, of delivery within local authorities, and, and you can see some of that um, happening. Um, in terms of local plans, then, um, the ones that are more successful are regarding housing as housing need across the whole authority not just um, housing need in terms of the local plan systems that the government requires us to operate uh, within. And um, I think when we can see that um, often in councils we've found because of austerity, there is a narrowing down of staff so that, that staff very often, the same person is writing the local plan as writing the housing strategy. And the housing strategy is coming up with a pattern of need that we've heard about from, from Mayor Dennett, but is also then um, dealing with the provision of housing through housing um, site allocations, and the two don't marry up. Um, councils are going beyond that now. When we look at Bristol and the, and, and the West of England approach, they're actually looking at all housing, all delivery, all of a piece, all housing need. And I think that that will be a trend that we'll, we'll see more of. Um, and that, that housing strategy is, is worth uh, looking at, I think, for that, um, uh, for that reason. Um, to using deliverability as a test, um, MPPF 2018-19 allows us to do that, and we are finding a lot of councils being a lot more rigorous um, in the way they're applying that deliverability test. So in Plymouth, um, basically, if you're at the top of the list and at the end of the year, you haven't delivered anything or you've submitted a non-compliant planning application, you're monitored and reviewed back to the bottom of the list. Um, so uh, councils are looking for those to, if you've been selected to be, um, if you like, supported in housing delivery by the council, then the council expects you to deliver. Uh, another example is South Oxfordshire, where um, all those um, coming forward with sites wanting to be in um, the housing allocation have been asked to identify the level of profit that they are expecting. And if they are expecting a high profit, then they're put to the bottom of the list because it's assumed that they're not looking for short-term delivery. And if they won't give an indication of their profit, they're also put to the bottom of the list because, um, uh, again, deliverability is uncertain. So those, those uh, landowners coming forward with a uh, profit which is expected to be met, um, and indeed in that case in Oxfordshire, an Oxbridge College um, is put, put in their land at agricultural value because they're looking to provide housing for academics, and so they've, they've immediately found out that that's the way to get to the top of the list. Um, so I think you know, this is a, a very different approach from local authorities being supine and waiting. This is about saying, you know, we know now how this works, and we're expecting you to perform. If you're, look, if you're expecting us to work with you. And I think that's a different kind of character of 
negotiation is what we've heard um, uh, the minister, Mr. Malthouse, also, also talk about, I think. Um, working with neighbouring authorities, um, again, looking at allocations and agreements, funding, nomination rights, we're starting to see some of this. Um, the work of Wigan, I think it's Lee here. Yes. We, you'll find you're in the final report, the longer report, because I think the approach in Wigan is well worth um, talking about, uh, particularly around older people and um, thinking about providing the right kind of, um, of housing for older people. I think it's 50% of the councils in Greater Manchester, their population growth is due to longevity and not to families. So uh, that's something that a lot of councils really need to face up to. So we've quoted your example in the, in the report. Um, obviously about um, thinking about practical um, elements like space standards, and we have a case study on this in Hartlepool, but also um, looking at another case study in Croydon where there's an SPD on um, intensification in suburban areas. Now, Croydon's suburbs may not be like yours, but nevertheless, um, they've shown through design how they can intensify um, in ways which are uh, uh, design appropriate, but also it's helping them um, in negotiation with applicants who are looking for far fewer dwellings on this kind of site. And um, it's, it's really uh, helped that in many ways. Um, councils want to develop their own stock, as we found before, to demonstrate quality. And, um, and also we found that um, when councils are looking to meet the planning numbers that they have to find um, each year to, re to report back on their local plans, that some of them are directly intervening by purchasing and converting properties just to make sure they hit their numbers. And when I've said that to planners, some have gasped. It never occurred to them to actually um, engage directly in delivery to, to make sure they, they hit their numbers. Um, affordable housing, well, obviously it's important to prioritise it. And um, much affordable housing gets knocked off the list because of other Section 106 requirements. Um, and uh, what we found is uh, almost all council... Um, schemes for their own companies are compliant with planning policy and contributions and that's been that's an important matter for councils to demonstrate to the private sector that you can build quality and you can build compliant development um, without having to go back with uh, more negotiation on uh, viability. Um, profit margins we've talked about and we're beginning to see now some councils are looking at type and tenure associated with their land allocations. So the Greater Manchester Spatial Framework is doing that. Other councils are doing that. So we'll see how that, how that progresses. Um, and it is possible to set evidence-based targets using well-being powers. And again, I think you know, we tend to think of planning powers quite narrowly, but there are other ways in which we can set targets um, for delivery. Um, uh, for affordable housing. And particularly, for example, we think about the local industrial strategies which were launched uh, last week, I think. Um, how can you have a successful local economy if your housing only manages? Um, who's going to drive the buses, empty the, the, the waste paper bins, if they still have paper, and uh, make the coffee? Um, you need a local industrial strategy needs a much greater diversity of housing to make it work. And I think we really need to, to build on that in our evidence about uh, mixed types of housing. Um, and uh, what we have found, I think, um, is that most councils now take the view, unless they are directly delivering housing, then affordable housing will not be provided. And we've seen a big shift away from the assumption that affordable housing can only be provided through Section 106. Now the assumption is that councils have got to intervene, provide in some way or other, whether that's through a company, a partnership, a JV, or in, in fact uh, through their own compliant development uh, of a mix of market and affordable. So we're beginning to see a change in view. Um, and uh, councils increasingly are looking to Homes England, or the government indeed, to re require Homes England to provide that kind of subsidy. We've had the mayor in London do it. He's provided councils with money uh, for uh, social rent. Um, why can't that be made available elsewhere, people are asking. I'll hand over to Ben now.
<clears throat> Thanks, Janice. Uh, just a, a few uh, key findings from the survey. So, uh, first of all, we did a survey to local authorities themselves. This is the bit that was funded by um, GL Hearn. Uh, and to do that, we, we utilised largely the same questions that were used in our 2017 survey. Uh, we just felt so much had happened even over a, a sort of one-year period um, that we were keen to capture what was going on. Um, and this was sent to named officers and local authorities who are involved in uh, housing and planning. Um, and so we, in some cases, got a couple of officers from the same authority responding, hence 184 uh, responses, but 142 uh, local authorities. Key headline in there, 69% um, of those authorities reported to us that they were directly delivering housing. So 69% of authorities uh, feel that they are directly engaged themselves in uh, the delivery of housing. Uh, and that was an increase from 65% uh, in our survey uh, the year before. Um, of those authorities, uh, there's a lot of activity around right to buy. 65% uh, are using right to buy receipts. That was the same as, as 2017 uh, to this latest survey. Uh, so because of some of the restrictions in, in the time, for example, you have to use these, uh, and particularly outside Greater London, um, we do actually still see quite a, a large amount there returned to the Treasury. 41% buying back former right to buy properties. 72% uh, of authorities said they were building or planning to build housing specifically uh, for older people. Uh, again, up from last year's survey results and 60% of authorities building or planning to build, uh, particularly for people with um, physical disabilities. 24% uh, of authorities said they're building uh, properties uh, to be below 60% market rent uh, specifically. Uh, the big question uh, we often get is about uh, numbers. Um, so central government does collect numbers uh, of uh, units, numbers of dwellings uh, delivered by house, uh, by local authorities, uh, but I think this data, and we've been trying to clarify that, just looks at sort of what local authorities are, are doing directly, so primarily through their uh, housing revenue accounts. Um, whereas we've tried to ask for all means, so including all companies that you have, be they wholly owned or, or, or joint venture. Um, so we only had uh, about half of authorities, but if we extrapolate uh, the average number of units delivered by that, that would be over 13,000 units uh, delivered by local authorities, including through their companies uh, over the last year. Uh, another really interesting thing in the, in the survey there was uh, in relation to motivations. Uh, so obviously providing uh, home ha housing to uh, meet housing need, uh, to uh, respond to the problems of homelessness uh, remains the top motivator for local authorities getting into directly uh, delivering housing. Um, but there are a range of other uh, motivations. The, the second uh, most important is in, in relation to income generation, uh, and particularly in, in, in this age of austerity. Um, that was the same from our, our 2017 survey to the latest survey. Uh, but the next motivator which had really come up was around uh, quality uh, and concerns uh, about design quality uh, that's often seen uh, through many private sector-led developments in, in local authority areas uh, and a desire to try and deliver a higher quality and demonstrate uh, the possibility of delivering a higher quality has uh, become a much more important motivator. We also asked in, in this year's survey about land and planning uh, more specifically. Um, so land seemed to be a, an important issue that we hadn't asked about in our previous survey. You can always think after a survey, I should have asked that. Uh, so this time we, we asked about uh, acquisition of land so 61% of authorities who responded to our uh, survey said they're acquiring uh, land or buildings uh, as part of a longer-term investment strategy, uh, and thinking particularly about that income generation uh, sec um, motivation. Uh, we also asked about if you're directly delivering housing, uh, whose land are you doing this on? Uh, so not surprisingly, authorities uh, would pretty much always start on their own uh, land holdings. Uh, so 95% of authorities let's say, the, the direct development uh, activities on their own uh, land holdings. Uh, but land holdings obviously vary uh, between authorities for a range of historic uh, reasons. Um, similarly, uh, authorities, uh, some of them upscaling quite considerably in their activity in this uh, area. Uh, so 44% said that they were now purchasing sites to develop. 42% um, were purchasing existing residential buildings, particularly often uh, to deal with homelessness and the amount uh, of money that's given on, on temporary accommodation uh, to the private sector at the moment. 17% uh, are using land from the One Public Estate Initiative, uh, and 13% have, have explored uh, any building on uh, other public land uh, that they've uh, acquired. Uh, we then also did this 100% desk survey. So, so the first survey I was just talking about is uh, us asking local authorities what they're doing. Uh, the desk survey is looking uh, 
from publicly available information uh, online, um, be this uh, through news reports, websites, councils, uh, own documents, committee reports, uh, etc. Um, so looking at that, uh, we found that in terms of companies in 2017, 57% of authorities had companies, uh, now it's 78%. Um, this is a slightly broader number um, than would be in our, our previous survey because you, you do then get into how we define companies. So what is a housing company? What is a property company? What's a company that's there to actually deliver housing? Uh, what's a company that's there perhaps to acquire property for investment reasons? Uh, actually, often the, the boundaries are quite blurred. Uh, and often, in fact, companies that are set up for one purpose soon sort of grow and, and, and get into to, um, other uh, areas, which is why we've defined this as widely as possible in this survey. Um, joint ventures, uh, we hadn't looked at uh, separately in 2017, but we did this time, uh, and we found that 57% of councils were in some sort of, of joint venture uh, in relation to housing. Um, of those councils without a company, 23% uh, were exploring establishing a company. Uh, equally, there were, were a few companies that had a company in 2017 that do not have one now. Um, in some cases, uh, local authorities have been exploring delivering through a company, um, but then the HRA uh, cap was lifted, uh, and they decided that actually they'd rather use that and, and deliver directly through that. Uh, in some cases, uh, there's been a rush to establish companies uh, because it's been a sort of thing that other authorities are doing, so let's do it ourselves. Um, but then after a sort of pause, there's, there's consideration that perhaps other means, uh, perhaps directly through councils, HRAs and general funds may be more suitable for what they're wishing uh, to do. Nevertheless, uh, there's still a, a trend of, of companies being established. So since January 2018, uh, we could find evidence of 119 uh, companies being established since that time, uh, wholly owned or joint venture. Uh, so there's a great deal of activity going on. Um, for councils that, that don't have a wholly owned company or, or a joint venture, or of course a, a housing revenue account under which they're building, uh, there seems to be a lot of what we're terming partnership activity. Um, probably need to do more work on what this means because uh, there's all kinds of announcements about uh, having engaged in various uh, partnership activity with a range of different people to, to deliver housing, but this seems to, to mean a multitude uh, of different things. Thinking about the Northwest uh, specifically, uh, so we hold two roundtables here. Uh, there's two detailed case studies. Uh, so this, of course, uh, today is, is a summary report, um, and then it's, uh, towards the end of July, our, our full detailed report uh, will come out. Um, there's still a, a bit of editing work that we're uh, doing with that. Um, and, and the detailed case studies from local authorities are, are in there. Uh, so we had Salford as a case study. We also had South Lakeland as a, a case study from the Northwest. Uh, there's quite a lot of detail from Wigan um, in the section of the report that deals with older people's housing as, as well. Looking at our table in the, in the northwest, uh, we found that 73% of local authorities uh, have companies, uh, housing and property companies. 63% uh, of local authorities in the northwest uh, are in joint ventures uh, related to housing. Um, and 46% have a housing revenue account, uh, although again, um, you need to sort of dig a, a bit deeper sometimes to see whether that's uh, active uh, or not. Um, and if we can briefly call up uh, the Excel spreadsheet that I had at the back. A bit dramatic pause. <laughs> if it's not working it's 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 not too much of a, a dramatic issue uh, essentially what we're doing is is we've already got uh, published on the rtbi's website our um survey findings um from the uh full desk survey that we did including all the web links that, that janice mentioned um, but we're putting it here we go uh, we're just putting that together uh, with the survey results uh, from uh, the direct GeoHealth and funded survey to local authorities themselves. Uh, so for each local authority, and I, I just put together here the, the Northwest, uh, you'll be able to see what they've uh, answered themselves. So have they said they're directly engaged in housing? Um, if they're not directly engaged, are they considering it? Uh, what they're doing about right to buy receipts, uh, building sub-market rents, et cetera, wholly owned companies, joint venture companies. If they've got companies, how many have they got? Um, 
most authorities have only got one, but uh, actually you then find some have got two, three, four, five, uh, even in some cases, often for slightly different purposes. Um, the name of the companies uh, and that uh, answer about acquiring more land or buildings. Uh, and then we've got the desk survey results. Did they have a company in 2017? Do they have a company now? What are the names of the companies? When was it founded? Uh, and there'll be a couple more columns. This, is, this one's still a, a slight work in progress, uh, but with the web links that Janice mentioned and the joint venture and partnership activity uh, to be added uh, to those as well. Uh, and the name of the companies is often quite important. It, it often doesn't relate to the local authority um, directly. Sometimes it does, but sometimes it, it doesn't. Uh, and so I think a lot of this activity is, is in some cases gone on uh, slightly below the radar that, that people don't always realize that, that, that these are wholly owned companies. Um, sometimes local authorities themselves have, have um, thought that perhaps if they're building housing, it's, it's best not uh, marketing it as the local authority. Some have come around to the view that actually it better is, and people do trust uh, local authorities as developers. Um, but so you get a variety of names for a variety of reasons. And, and so this is uh, aiming to provide a resource uh, where if people are interested in particular local authorities, they can look up and, and see from our two surveys together. Uh, the results uh, of that. Uh, so that fuller um, uh, spreadsheet will, will be expanded out for, for all local authorities uh, and again will be put onto the RTPI website uh, when our more detailed uh, survey is, is uh, uh, and report is published uh, later in July. Uh, so we can just see there scrolling through the, the, the activity there with the various authorities in the Northwest. Thank you very much. If we could just go back to the uh, PowerPoint, please. Uh, and uh, as we switch back to the PowerPoint, we're switching back uh, to Janice. So, um, just really to draw this to a conclusion, um, in the report you'll see that they're the findings um, that we've, that we've uh, come up with from our research looking at uh, 12 issues. Um, there were going to be uh, 10 originally, but we added two. Um, one was around relationships and the other one was around small sites because these issues came up um, during the research and we thought we should add them in. So um, uh, what you'll see when you get the full report in July is all the background material that led to those uh, findings. Um, and so just in conclusion to say, um, say that just, just to say that corporate commitment is key um, I haven't mentioned much about relationships with providers, but that's um, also a significant issue. And as the, the house, local housing forum, if you like, is a mechanism for supporting and developing that. The intensive monitoring and the intervention. So some councils have got um, taken a drawdown from the Public Works Loans Board that they're actually using as an intervention fund. Um, and that's something that councils can consider doing if they're not already. Um, we're obviously um, the need for internal skills and the retention of those skills um, and that's, that remains a, an issue. But it hasn't been an overwhelming issue in that we're aware of it, but it hasn't been overwhelming in the feedback that we've had. So that's not to say it's not important, but it hasn't been something that's been necessarily put through as a very important issue in, in this research. The local plan is only one means of achieving um, housing delivery, um, but it is an essential feature of supporting quality housing um, and, uh, and an extended role for the local plan now as part of a wider delivery mechanism at local level. Um, obviously, thinking about the type of development, housing development um, required in local plans in terms of type and tenure, We've suggested that the use classes order might be reviewed because this came up um, in a number of places and thinking about how one might be using that in a different way. And um, thinking about having, you have great local plan policies, but they do also need to be negotiated. So I hope that that's um, given you a taste and flavor of the research. Um, and obviously we are looking forward to any questions or comments that you may have. We very much welcome your feedback. Thank you for listening. Um, it, it's interesting to note that uh, from research which started about what local authorities are doing in directly providing housing, that there's a great deal of learning coming there about what local authorities are doing in the broader sense about ensuring delivery of housing, 
Uh, and quite clearly, there's an awful lot there for us to learn. I think case studies you've referred to, like Wigan, uh, obviously have got a lot uh, that others can, can learn from. Uh, and we certainly look forward from the RTPI point of view in spreading that learning around uh, all our members uh, throughout the UK and indeed into the Republic of Ireland. Um, now we're at the, the question session. So has anybody got a question, burning question they'd like to... Oh, here we go. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> Straightforward. Uh, gentlemen, the, the, the back. Thank you. Thanks. Um, in the issue 10 on quality, you don't mention energy efficiency at all, which seems to be a, a massive issue for housing at the moment. And some local authorities are doing some fantastic work in directly providing passive house homes, yeah, yeah. like Exeter City Council and Norwich City Council yeah, to yeah. make Norwich the passive house capital of um, the UK. So in your final report, are you going to mention energy efficiency in the quality section? Um, you'll find energy efficiency is mentioned in relation to Bristol, and it was mentioned in 2017 in relation to one of our case studies in North Kestephen. Um, but Ben, do you want to say if anything came out of the, the quality work in addition to that? Um, it was mentioned a few times, and the, 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 there is a, a quite a lot of discussion about um, standards uh, and the way, in some senses, uh, we seem to have moved away at a national level from, from having prescribed standards and whether uh, that's something they would like to see uh, brought back in um, to, mm -hmm. to sort of strengthen the arm of local authorities around uh, requiring this. Um, so it, it is mentioned in there. Um, I wouldn't say it's, it's, it's a headline issue, but it is something that a lot of local authorities are um, quite passionate about. Mm -hmm. And I think the other thing that was coming through as the research progressed was the issue of um, the climate emergency and thinking about retrofitting existing homes. And what you'll find in the fuller report is um, an examination of the arguments for local plans considering all the housing stock and not just new development. And I think that's that to the, so it's at that level um, that, that you will find it as well, I think. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, Colin Hurst from Ribble Valley, Borough Council in Lancashire. Um, one of the things I'm interested in is, through the research, did you find a sort of discernible <coughs> difference between um, a rural perspective and a, an urban perspective? For example, when you um, put up the examples of, of companies, most of them were unitary authorities or fairly big urban um, districts that were looking at probably tackling a lot of regeneration issues. One of the issues that I'm interested in from a very rural perspective is looking at how we can intervene to really tackle the problem of um, affordability, which is the, the real driver mm. for us. Um, I don't know whether any of those issues came out through the research. I, mean, I think I would say if you look, when you look at the whole survey rather than the extract from the northwest, you'll find that councils of every size have companies, um, urban and rural. So um, that's a you know, that's, we don't find any particular um, difference between types of authorities. That's by size, type, um, in terms of politics, um, and in, in terms of geography, whether which region or which type of, of area. So I think that, that's the first thing to say. I think the second thing to say in rural areas, obviously there are more frequently smaller sites, um, and so we, you know, we do have South Lakeland as a more rural area, though perhaps you might argue not uh, no, not altogether typical of everywhere. Pretty rural. <laughs> yeah, pretty rural. Um, and I think um, what you found, what you find there, when we, for example, at the round table we had in um, East Anglia, um, there were big concerns there, particularly about the way local housing associations were being sucked up into the mergers and acquisitions that are going on at the minute, and where um, often councils had transferred their stock to a small local um, housing association. Um, and you know, the staff and everyone sort of, it was a good local relationship between the council and, and, and the, and the um, housing association. These have now been sucked up in, and, and so the housing office is closed locally, that the rent roll is being invested somewhere else. Um, and um, and these, new, these larger housing associations won't develop smaller sites that are in rural areas. So that's actually turned as a motivator for those councils to get building themselves. Um, interestingly. So um, I think 
in terms of smaller sites, you can look at um, Cambridgeshire County Council's building small sites, and so are some of the um, Norfolk and, and Suffolk districts, for example, in a rural area. So there will be examples. They won't necessarily be from, from the northwest, um, but there are, there are examples there. Hi, I'm a lecturer in urban planning in the University of Manchester, and thank you very much for the presentation, and I'm looking forward to read the full report in end of July. My question is, is well, since we are here in Combine Authority, I thought I might ask a question about strategic, strategic planning and sub-regional planning and perhaps role of strategic planning in terms of tackling the housing delivery. And questions directly related to actually places outside Combine Authorities like Nottingham, Stoke-on-Trent, and Blackpool. Do you think there's an appetite from local authorities towards talking with their neighbors and perhaps providing and delivering housing in combination with, with, with help of the partnership with their neighbors or everyone more isolated and more focused on delivering the targets set by for their own local area? Or are there sort of things that are going on? Because you, pa you mentioned in passing there are certain things going on. I was not sure at what scale these things are happening or what sort of appetite from local authorities actually towards that. And do you think the county councils or similar sub-regional organizations have any role, could have any role helping local authorities delivering more housing? Thank you. Um, well, if you just take the combined authorities, if you look at the combined authority for Peterborough and Cambridgeshire, the mayor has just announced that he's going to establish a development company, which will be for infrastructure and housing. That was on the 28th of February. So we haven't actually seen yet what that will do, but I think that's the first combined authority where the mayor has taken that role. So I think that's, that's interesting. If you look at a lot of the other examples we have, um, I think it's interesting how many councils are working together, although not necessarily in the more formal structures of combined authorities. So um, at one case study is Plymouth, and they're working with two other councils and um, uh, their neighbours. Uh, another case study is South Worcestershire, where there are three councils working together. Another example is Bristol, where there are four councils working together. Another example is Salford, where you have ten councils working <laughs> together. Um, so uh, in Doncaster, the role, there's another case study in Doncaster, obviously um, the Sheffield City region. Um, is important there. So you're beginning to see some of that, and the report does have a short section on combined authorities. To answer your question about the future, then I think if you do an analysis of the MPPF 2018, it's going to be impossible for any council to prepare a local plan without that strategic component, whether that's for housing, for infrastructure, for economic development or the environment. And I'm not sure yet whether the planning profession has understood this marked change in the MPPF um, that was brought about. Because I think when councils start to do their reviews of local plans, they will realise they are going to be, these plans are going to be different, more strategic plans than the plans that they've prepared in the past. But we're not quite there yet. But we're, th there is a reference to this in the longer report. Okay. Any uh, Sorry, gentleman in the blue jumper? Hi, thanks for the presentation thought was really good. Uh, just a question on Homes England. Um, it says within the report that um, it's not yet supported local authorities in the direct provision of social housing outside of grants available through the HRA. Um, so I'm just interested to know if, if you, what actions local authorities can take in order to um, uh, influence um, Homes England in terms of uh, making more grants available and a broader question really in terms of I think there's a lot of really good intelligence and evidence within your report and how do you see the report recommendations and conclusions being taken for particularly through the political process because I think there's a great opportunity for it to be used to influence and to lobby and to hopefully persuade people for investment in housing on lots of different fronts thank mm. you um, I think firstly on Homes England, then um, I have asked the Minister whether he would consider rolling out the scheme in Greater London, where the Mayor has given um, a billion pounds to councils to provide social housing. Um, and secondly, has provided £10 million for skills support to those councils who receive that funding. 
Um, both of those have been done within the last year. And I asked uh, Mr Malthouse whether he would consider instructing Homes England to do the same across the rest of England. And he said his mind was open. So uh, that's not to say that he'll be housing minister in a few weeks' time. <laughs> um, but who, who's to say? But nevertheless, I do think that... Um, I suppose what we found about Homes England generally is that they're there, but they're not very central. Um, and councils will use them for HIF bids and so on, and obviously for older people's housing, but they they're kind of don't seem to be very central. And I think it's almost, uh, it's important to raise that because they have the title, but they don't seem to be big players in most places uh, in comparison with some of their predecessor organisations. In terms of taking it forward, or, well, Mayor Dennis, you want to say something? No, no, no. no. no, no, no. no, no. I was going to say, in terms of um, want to take it forward, then next week there will be a fringe session at the LGA conference, which will be chaired by Lord Porter, who's just stepped down as head of the LGA. So, um, uh, and there will be you know, any opportunity taken to... Uh, to promote this and it's certainly true that the ministry is very very interested in the data and the content and they've already crawled over the interim report and the desk survey because I've had feedback from them with questions they've asked me questions about it so I, I think that it will as the last report was the last report we gather was taken into Downing Street to support the change in policy um, so we're hoping through the LGA interest and through um, official interest, which seems to be there, that it will get some traction. Yeah, no, um, there were some really interesting statistics published only last week by Homes England on grant allocations and what that's delivered. And what was really interesting is the headline was the government had delivered more affordable homes, but actually there's been a 12% reduction in the amount of social rented accommodation that's actually been delivered up and mm. down the country. So fundamentally, we have a structural problem with the grant regime here. Um, and obviously, it looks at income levels and house prices and where there's a certain threshold, then government will justifiably intervene. And obviously, all of this goes through green book appraisals, benefit cost ratio. And it's a nightmare because at the moment, you know, the north is, is basically written off in terms of being able to access some of the grants that are available through Homes England. Approximately 80% from the modelling mm -hmm. we've done is going into the south of the country and London. And many local authorities in the north can't actually apply for this available funding just because ultimately they don't have what the government perceive as an affordability crisis, mm -hmm. um, which is, is, is bonkers, really. Um, we've got 97,000 people on our housing waiting list in Greater Manchester. 26,000, I think it is, are in absolute need, priority need. Um, so surely that should be the data we're using to determine where or not the state decides to intervene. But at the moment, we have a system which is fundamentally driven by econometrics and methodologies that look at the housing market and don't necessarily look at human needs. So transforming that is, is really, really important moving forward. And it's great that the housing minister has an open mind on this issue, but what I would point to is, you know, 12% regression in terms yeah. of social rents is nothing to be proud of when we've got an absolute housing crisis on our hands. Gentlemen, uh, thank you, Richard Arkell, RTPI Northeast. Um, warmly uh, welcome the um, report. It's emerging findings. Um, something that um, you said in in your introductory remarks about um, raising standards and emphasised again, obviously, um, by Janice and Ben in summarising the research. Um, took me back to um, one of the objectives of Washington Development Corporation when it was established in the northeast of England, designated, I think, in the late 60s, really got cracking in the early 70s, and that was to raise by example the standard of development um, in that particular sub-region. Um, has any consideration been given to the use of mayoral development corporations? Because I think the, the research does seem to emphasize that planning can do so much, but hey, land ownership's incredibly important, and you can't beat the combination of public sector ownership um, as well as sound planning 
to bring about the changes that are so urgently needed in the housing market. So I'm thinking about the, you know, mayoral development. Yes, yeah, yeah. The option didn't specifically explore mayor or development corporations per personally, but the, the, the comment you made there, but, um, I think a sort of subheading of this might be planning's not enough, um, and, and versions for, of that we, we heard so many times that, that, that uh, the best one in the world, the, the planning system is not gonna deliver all the affordable housing we need uh, through uh, just trying to get section 106 uh, from uh, private market housing. Uh, and similarly, we see time and time again constraints on um, the planning system in terms of trying to enforce standards, uh, all the sort of viability concerns about space standards, whether you can even adopt those uh, locally are, are, are quite a constraint. So I think the, the, the role of the local authority is, is a developer in terms of um, a demonstration uh, of housing quality is, is hugely important and in this area of great potential. Uh, and absolutely, combining that with, with land ownership I think is, is very important. What we are also finding is, is local authorities starting to look more and more actually at their land ownings uh, and finding in many cases that, that perhaps there's more extensive uh, ownings than, than have perhaps been realised mm. once you start looking together and putting sites together and looking where you really can uh, actually develop. Mm. I mean, what we, we heard in the survey, we didn't put the figure up, is that um, the, the challenge of land uh, for local authorities is the highest challenge. But then we also saw that 95% are building on their own sites. And, and that may sound as if it's a, a bit of a discrepancy. But I think what's happened, um, again, this is anecdotally around the country, is that councils have realised that their property colleagues are just, have just given them, um, if you like, an indication of those sites which, the, which property colleagues think are suitable for housing or which have been held in the housing revenue account. But because of things like um, one public estate, it's now possible to see all the land ownership in the local authorities' area. And some councils, small councils, have got 1,000 or 2,000 sites. In fact, some county councils have 800 sites in one, one town. And so um, what's happening is that uh, those teams, delivery teams, and delivery teams, are actually going through each site the council owns with either an architect or a development surveyor to actually see the potential of, the, of every site. And even if it's a small site, is it suitable to go onto the self-build register? So we're seeing a very proactive approach to council's own land. But I don't know, do you want to say something about mayoral development corporations? Is it more so, um, equipped than we are? Yeah, well, not necessarily. <laughs> um, in, Gre in Greater Manchester, obviously, we're, we're starting to trial mayoral development corporation powers in Stockport. And what the mayor's done is he's linked all of this to the town centre challenge, so where we're trying to basically increase urban density and rejuvenate, if you like, some of our ailing town centres within Greater Manchester. That's what we're trying to do here. But I have to say, from a, from a resource point of view, it's, it's a huge challenge. So although we have the powers, we don't necessarily have the resources. So you'll be familiar with Greater Manchester. We were trying to land a 68 million pounds housing deal for Greater Manchester. Eight million of that was revenue over the next few years. To be able to build that team and that resource base here in the combined authority to be able to do a lot of this work because you know, local authorities have been absolutely decimated since 2010 in Greater Manchester. My local authority, as I said, you know, 53% of the revenue support grant gone. Housing teams, regeneration teams, unless you've got growth, you know, absolutely decimated within local councils. So my, my, my only concern is, yes, it's about powers, um, but it's also about having the resources to be able to do all of the work you're talking about. Because, you know, to do all that work in that space around quality and given our aspirations to become carbon neutral by 2038, net zero carbon homes from 2028, that's a massive amount of work for Greater Manchester to do. And at the moment, we're doing that through partnership, through collaboration, through the 10 districts. The combined authority itself doesn't have a massive amount of resources. We're trying to use some of the housing loans fund money, the 300 million recycling <coughs> we got from government when there was a financial crash back in 20. 2008, sorry, 2007, 8. Um, and we're using some of the interest from that to build a team, but we're only talking about small amounts of, of resource, really, in the grand scheme of things. Greater Manchester is very different to the GLA. You know, Homes England was collapsed into London at a time when Homes England was actually relatively well resourced. 
So we're, talk we're talking about comparing apples with pears here. Mm. If you're talking about comparing Greater Manchester with you know Greater London in terms of the resources available to do all this work, but you know we've got a strategy, we've got a vision. We are thinking outside the box. We don't see housing and planning in isolation. It is about its relationship with that broader infrastructure piece, transportation, walking and cycling, health and well-being, also local industrial strategy. We see housing and planning as very much integral to how we deliver on that vision. Um, but the real challenge now is the implementation of all of that and where we get the resources from. So continuing to lobby government for fair funding for the North is, is really important. Just give you a statistic, because I think this is really useful. IPPR recently launched some research and they talked about cuts since 2009-10. The North has seen real-term cuts in public spending of 3.6 billion, while the South East and the South West has actually seen increases in the region of 4.7 billion. And if you think about that over time, you quickly realize what the cumulative impact of all this is and why we actually have an imbalanced economy in the United Kingdom. Yeah. As, as Northern living in the South, I uh, <laughs> entirely echo that. Um, it, 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 is, it is significant that the mayoral development corporations in London are taking land which is essentially worth very little because of either it's, it's landlocked, it's in pretty poor uses, it's got contamination issues, and it's really creating huge value out of those, and that's what's firing the, the entire mechanism. Now, you know, you, you, you just could be realistic about what, uh, in the other metropolitan areas, the increases in land values can create. Uh, it's quite an issue. But that one about resources, resources in planning departments is obviously something we're crit critically uh, involved with. And we do seem to be making some headway with the current uh, ministers uh, in that respect. Um, you know, my fear, uh, as Janice has already echoed, is that we may find we're, we're back to square one with a new set of ministers in, in not too many weeks' time, and then we start all over again. Um, are there any final... So, yeah, right. L lady at the front and then gentleman at the back. Thank you. Um, actually, just picking up on the point about resources, does, does your research cover um, that uh, at all in terms of sort of capacity um, within, you know, the local authorities? Because, sorry, I, my name's Caroline Pillay. I'm, I'm from Airy Miller, um, and we're um, uh, consultants, and we work with local authorities to... Um, sort of support and provide the capacity, if you like, to, to start building. And we, we, we're increasingly being approached by local authorities who simply just don't have manpower. They don't have development managers, they don't have project managers. They have sites, they have planning, hence why, you know, um, you know their, their sort of starts on sites aren't happening on time because they just isn't the resources. It's, it'll be interesting to know whether or not the authorities that um, engaged in your research, where where they are, or did they did you comment? Did they comment at all about capacity issues? Um, as I said earlier, they didn't particularly, and I think that that's I, I recognise those capacity issues are there. So I'm not I'm not dismissing those at all. It's just that the councils we talked to um, didn't express them, and, and I think it just we didn't know that we'd selected councils that had gone for this development team approach before we started. It that, that just emerged. We didn't select them for that reason. That, that sort of came out of the research. Um, and so, um, but I th also think that quite a lot of councils have lost the um, understanding about uh, how to generate um, uh, resources from fees and so on from development projects. So, you know, what every council used to have was a really good capital accountant and often before you became director of finance for a council you had to have been the capital accountant and their roles have been very reduced so in a way it's 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 partly um, uh, it's partly understanding how the system works but there is also obviously a concern to find the right people um, but as what we found is, talking about development surveyors, that councils have found them in many different ways, and whether that's sharing, whether that's funding someone through the JV route, um, whether it's about having someone from um, the private sector, someone who comes in a couple of days a week. You know, there seems to be a kind of trying to find these different methods, which won't last in the longer term, because as things scale up, you need more people. But there's definitely been a big shift in the last two years to find people who can help. 
but it's not there yet. So. There was a, a bit on the um, survey results um, about uh, sort of skills as, as a barrier to doing more in, in some cases. Um, project management came up actually in the Islington case study um, and, and those skills uh, and sort of competing of course with housing associations uh, and private developers sometimes for the, the same sort of pool of, of, of people. Mm. Um, what also was mentioned in that one was, was of course it's not just uh, planning and development directly but it's all kinds of associated things so that they're, they're trying to upscale in Islington but actually the council's legal department has suffered lots of cuts under austerity. Um, the council's finance department has suffered lots of cuts under austerity so sometimes um, the, through your housing activity you're actually having to support all kinds of different ways of the, the council and uh, of course there are examples where the council's own housing activity is funding planners within the council uh, etc just to try and unblock some of these shortages okay uh, i'm andrew stunnel i'm a liberal democrat member of the house of lords with the responsibility for the construction brief and i come from stockport uh, it's, it's an excellent uh, piece of work that's been done. Uh, but it, uh, if I could just make the same point as a colleague uh, earlier on about um, climate change and standards. You do have a point there about standards uh, reported, and I wasn't quite sure whether you'd swapped from reporting to recommending, but your recommendation seems to be about access and disability and placemaking rather than perhaps the fundamental challenge of climate change. I just wondered if you'd like to uh, pick that point up. Um, secondly, completely different point is clearly there's a, there's a financial constraint which is real and difficult. Uh, there's a market constraint which is real and difficult, but there's also a skills constraint on the construction industry, which means that if you ever get anywhere near 300,000 homes a year, there won't be the people to build them. And mm. I wondered whether uh, modern methods of manufacture or other approaches are in the compass of the evidence you've taken or of the recommendations you're going to make? Um, to take the last point, obviously we're aware of uh, lots of organisations, councils, housing associations involved in uh, modern methods of construction, but we haven't particularly dealt with those in this research, so um, I think there are others looking at that, so, so uh, we haven't done that. In terms of climate, the climate change climate emergency, I think what you'll see in the fuller report is uh, rather more on the needs of the whole of the housing stock and the interrelationships between um, uh, the types of stock and rather than just a focus on new development. So I think the standards element can, can possibly deal with the climate change points on, on construction and so on and layout and access. But actually, we mention in the full report concerns that many have expressed to us about um, fuel poverty, about the way in which um, the existing stock is not fit for purpose, how particularly for own, poorer owner-occupiers, there's no mechanism by which it can be made fit for purpose. And uh, we discuss um, issues such as why can't Section 106 be used to um, think about um, retrofitting properties to meet um, climate requirements. So you might not see it here, but I think you will see more of that in, in the full report. We are, we are certainly aware of that. Yeah. Uh, and if I can just add, it is certainly an issue which the RTPI is, is very fully uh, on. Um, I gave a keynote speech at the planning convention last week and climate change and planning involvement with climate change was a key part of that. Uh, and one of the things we're very concerned about, and it goes back to the issue of resources, is to affect the change that we need to make. We need significantly greater resources, uh, particularly within planning authorities, to be able to do the positive planning that's required to deliver policies, but also to resource things like this in terms of retrofitting of properties and ensuring that we're getting the new properties constructed to the right standards. Uh, there's a lot of work to do. Um, we're certainly uh, very keen and ambitious to do that but we recognise that the heart of all of that, we're back to the issue of resources again. Um, are there any further questions? I think we've probably just about timely reached the... Uh, we, we th we'd marked 6.30 as the, the end of the session, so uh, thank you, everybody, for the questions. There's quite clearly going to be an opportunity for the next uh, 10 or 15 minutes, if you want to, to ask questions directly uh, of Ben and Janice. But can I thank... Paul, uh, 
Mayor of Salford, can I thank Janice uh, and Ben for the work they've done, for the ongoing work you're doing, uh, and for presenting to us this evening. Uh, and thank you all for coming. It's, it's good to see you here, uh, and I hope you have a pleasant journey home this evening. Thank you. Thank you.